We're in week four of a series on the armor of God from Ephesians chapter six, all right? And so far, just to kind of cover what we've got, what we've learned in the first three weeks of this series is this. We've broken the book into two parts. It can basically be seen this way. The first part of Ephesians chapters one through three are theological, filled with blessings, the blessings of salvation in Christ. That's the first three chapters. They're not practical. They're exciting. They're theological. They're foundational. What did Jesus do for us and who are we in Christ? The last three chapters are intensely practical. They're all about character. In light of all these blessings we have in Christ because of his death and resurrection, how then should we live all right? And then we get to this last section, Ephesians chapter 6, which is this incredibly famous passage where Paul tells the church in Ephesus to put on the armor of God. Now, many Christians over the years, as we often do, we've got chapters and verses in the, in the Bible that weren't there in the original. We tend to look at some of these passages, these famous passages, on their own. So we almost think of this armor of God passage as this like new teaching separate from the rest of Ephesians, which was about, you know, theological blessings in Christ, character, how do we live in light of that? And now there's this separate new teaching on spiritual warfare. But in fact, what we've learned so far in this series is that the armor of God is not new teaching about spiritual warfare. It is a powerful picture summary of the rest of the book, specifically the second half of the book. So the armor of God, actually, if we want to just sum it up in an easy way that we can remember for the rest of our lives, when you think about putting on the armor of God, what we're actually talking about is putting on the character of God. It's a picture summary of the character traits in the rest of chapters 4 through 6. Again, the important thing to know here is that spiritual warfare is not something separate you do in your life. All right, it's not like I have this list of all the things I, I need to do in my life. I, I need to go to work. I need to pay my bills. I need to spend time with family and friends. I need to go to church. I need to do spiritual warfare. That's not the picture we get in Ephesians. In Ephesians, the picture of spiritual warfare is, that, is actually not as an extra thing to do in your life. It's the way you live your life. When you live your life with goodness and love and courage, and honesty, and kindness, and patience, living your life that way, speaking that way, being that way in everyday life, is one of the greatest acts of warfare you can do. That is your act of spiritual warfare. In the midst of a world of darkness, and chaos, and outrage, and fear, when we live in hope, and peace, and loving kindness, and goodness, we are living the spiritual warfare that Paul is talking about in Ephesians. So now this is a bit different maybe than the picture that some of us have sometimes had. Which is, and it's not about it being wrong. It's just a bit of a different angle on it that Ephesians takes than what we normally think of with spiritual warfare. Which is often as Christians we think of spiritual warfare as this like aggressive thing where we go out looking for the devil, looking for demonic spirits, and like fighting with them or attacking with them and all those sorts of things. But in fact, in Ephesians, we see that the armor of God is about the character of God. And there's actually, before, uh, we're going to come back to Ephesians right away, but I actually want to read you, someone wrote me an email last week that brought to mind a really wonderful story. I love these like funny little stories that pop up in the Bible where you get a brand new glimpse into how things work that's often different than how we think. And so I want to take you to the only specific demon casting out story in the entire New Testament outside of the Gospels. Okay, this is the only specific exorcism story outside of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's found in Acts chapter 16, all right? And I want you to get a whole new feel for how the Apostle Paul lived out this thing of like that we sometimes think of as this aggressive thing called spiritual warfare. I want you to see how Paul lives this out in what is actually a rare story outside of the Gospels. Acts 16. Luke is writing, Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit. Now, the question is, 
How do they even know she has a spirit? Have you ever th- stopped and wondered that? How do they know she had a spirit? Yeah, is there like a little light glowing above her head? Demon inside of me. All right? Well, let's keep reading. By which she predicted the future. So that's maybe part of it. The fact that she has employment predicting the future. Which brings up a whole bunch of questions. Can demons sell a future? And the answer is no. But we're not going to get into that. We'll just leave that as a question mark for you to think about this week. Sometimes you come to CrossFit here and you leave with more questions than answers. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. By fortune telling. But again, the question is, how do they know she has a spirit? She's not wearing a t-shirt that says, I have an evil spirit. How do they know? All right? Well, we're going to find out in the next line. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. Okay, how did they know that she had a demon? How would you know, how would you feel if a girl followed you around everywhere you went? You went grocery shopping. You went to get an oil change. You went home to set up your Christmas tree. And everywhere you went, this girl followed you shouting. These men are servants of the most high God. Yelling, yelling, yelling everywhere you go. How did they know she had a demon? Because she was physically manifesting obvious signs of severe. You know, we would think this girl has not just some social problems. She has severe mental problems. Now remember what we looked at last week. Every time in scripture where we see a demon being cast out of people, it is always associated with very obvious signs you can see with your eye, eyes of either physical or mental, you know, what we would call now health, mental health or physical health. Either they're blind, either they can't, sp- or they can't speak, or they're running around cutting themselves and screaming, Or in this case, she's following them around and screaming, always in the Bible. Now, this is really important. And we're just doing a quick review again of last week. Nowhere in Scripture do we see examples of a sin demon being cast out. Where where an apostle or a Christian looks at someone and says, you know, like sometimes you'll hear people. And by the way, this is not about criticizing, uh, uh, you know, what maybe other Christians think of spiritual warfare as being. It's just about talking about what's actually in the Bible. There's lots of things we do that aren't in the Bible. It doesn't mean they're bad. There's nothing in the Bible about preaching behind a lectern on Sunday mornings. But we do it anyway. All right? But I just want us to be aware of what's actually in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does anyone ever look at someone and say, I see a spirit of lust on you, and then cast out a spirit of lust. Or a spirit of anger. Or a spirit of greed. Again, not criticizing Christians who do that. There's lo- Again, like I said, there's lots of things we might do and do do that are not directly in Scripture. But it's always good to remind ourselves of what actually is in Scripture because it keeps us from straying sometimes too far. All right? So how does Paul know he has a spirit? It's not that he just sees, oh, I think I see a spirit on you. She is physically manifesting disturbing behavior. All right? which is important. So she's following him around and shouting. Now, the, the, the crazy thing is what happens next is that she does this for how many days? Many days. Now, this is actually profound. Let's just stop and think about that for a moment. According to the picture I think we sometimes have about spiritual warfare, the idea is, you know, you're out, you know, we're out there looking for demons and when you see a demon, you get aggressive, you cast them out. What we see here with Paul is the opposite. He actually ignores. Imagine you had, again, like I said before, this girl following you around, shouting everywhere you go, and you ignore it. Not for a minute, not for an hour, not for a day. Many days, he just goes about his life. He goes about his mission. He goes about what he's doing. That's kind of profound, And it's only finally after many days, finally, and I want you to notice the emotion here, Paul becomes so what? Annoyed. Get out of here. Now, this, again, this is profound. Let's pay attention to what's happening here. Many days, she's screaming in his face. Paul is not, is clearly, his mission in life is not seek and destroy demons. His mission in life is 
I am spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have a mission here where I am. And I'm living that mission. And even when there is absurd behavior right in my face, he goes on about his business until finally he can't take it anymore. And then he just says, finally, he becomes so annoyed, not afraid, not angry, irritated. He becomes so annoyed that he turns around and says to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. Now, there's another thing I want you to notice here as well. Paul does not stop and tell Luke. After this, they just move on to another story in the book of Acts. And I always find this kind of stuff so fascinating in Scripture. Paul does not turn around and say to Luke, oh, by the way, we need to do a quick seminar now. How to cast out an evil spirit. Uh, so step one, da 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 da. Step two, da 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 da. Step three, da 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 da. You get the point. Lots of da 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 da's. And step four, now you cast out the demon. He is irritated. He essentially says, in the name of Jesus, get out of here. That's it. Done. The girl stops screaming. Now, my question is, now, Western society, we like to turn everything into a science. We like to turn everything into a formula. And by the way, that works in a lot of ways. That works when you want to build a rocket. That works when you want to build cars and buildings with heating and cooling. So I like so many aspects of that way of thinking with science and logic and formulas. The problem comes when we try to apply formulas and that kind of scientific thinking to spiritual stuff. And so what you'll see, I actually went on Amazon a couple of times this week. And I went on Amazon to see how much teaching can I find on deliverance and strongholds and casting out demons. And I found dozens, like pages after pages after pages after pages book after book after book. By the way, not all bad. I've read some of those books in my life. No doubt some of you have. Not bad thing to do. Again, the point here is not to criticize. The point here is not to feel shame or to say that's the wrong way of doing things. It's just interesting to me that Paul finally gets annoyed and says, get out of here. And then we multiply massive amounts of information and steps how to find out if you have a demonic stronghold, how to overcome it, how to get rid of a demon. Not because it's bad, it's a, it's a product of our way, Western way of thinking. I totally get that. And yet, what we see in Scripture is much simpler. So my question is, why, why are we so attracted to multiplying information and steps and instructions about something in Scripture for which there are no instructions or steps. And I think there's a couple of reasons that will actually help us get to the root of lots of our psychology as, as Christians in a way that might be helpful as we look at the armor of God. I think one of the reasons that we multiply information and instructions and steps and talk about spiritual warfare so much, though it's a minor topic and simple in Scripture is because that kind of information actually offers us, and I mean this in such a good way, all of us desire a simple way to make sense of our complex problems. Have you ever noticed, and again, if you're here today and you are more than 15 years old, you have probably noticed this. You might have noticed this before 15 years old already. But have you ever noticed that life is complicated? Any of you ever noticed that? How many of you have noticed that life is complicated? Shoot. Everything's complicated. Health is complicated. I mean, I wonder how many here this morning, you have health stuff, where in the last year, you have gone to doc, you've bounced between doctors and specialists, and they don't know what's wrong with you, so you just keep bouncing. And you wish... Oh, I wish someone would just tell me what the problem is. 
How about relationship problems? How many of us here have relationship problems with our family? Or if we're married, it could be a spouse with people at work, with our parenting. And how many of us wish those problems were simple? Now, those problems, when I was in my 20s, I thought all those problems were simple. But the older I get, the more I realize none of that is simple. Otherwise, we would all be living at peace with each other, happy every Christmas gathering. But we don't. Is it because we want? I just love having angry, awkward Christmas gatherings. We wish we didn't have angry, awkward Christmas gatherings, but we have them anyway because solving relational problems is complicating. complicated. Solving health problems is often uh, complicated. Solving character problems is often, you know, complicated. You know, someone has an anger problem, and it's like, well, you know, back in my 20s, it was like, just pray more and stop it. Pray more and stop it. That was the Chris Dirksen solve your problems trick. Guess how many people got help? Zero, <laughs> including myself. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, why do people, there's a hundred reasons at least why in a given moment someone gets angry from genetic. I mean, some people are just genetically predisposed to have more anger. The way you were raised the habits you saw growing up of how your parents handled anger, the stress you feel in the moment, how much sleep you got last night, and on and on and on and on. And if you want to solve your anger problem, the, the solution will also be complex. So sometimes as Christians, we are desperate for something simple. And sometimes the spiritual warfare narrative gives us something simple and concrete. Maybe my anger problem isn't something I have to maybe see counseling about and maybe change some of my eating and sleeping habits and deal with this stressor at work and all that stuff. Maybe it's actually none of that. Maybe it's a demon. Maybe it's a spirit of anger. And if I can just figure out how to cast that spirit out, then I won't have an anger problem anymore. It simplifies something that's complex, which is something we all desire. We get it. Maybe if I can just find that spirit of disunity or that spirit of Jezebel that came into my, my marriage, then, you know, I won't need to look up, you know, a counselor. I won't need to do some emotional work. We won't need to work through our communication issues. We can just figure out what demon it is, cast it out, and then everything will be solved. It, it makes complex things simple. And then this brings up a second thing. It can offer to us a sense of control over our problems. And I, I mean, I just think sometimes some of the stuff we go, to is so, go through is so hard when you don't know how to fix it. When you go through a health problem and it goes on and on and on and nobody can tell you what it is. You're grasping. Just, I just need an answer. What's causing this? And so if someone tells you, oh, maybe it's a spirit of this, maybe, then it's easy to latch onto that and think, now I have a sense of control. I know what the problem is. I know how to fix it. None of that is bad. It's just why, why are we seeking some of this information when the Bible itself doesn't give us? So but there's four things I just want to, and I'm going to, get into Ephesians here, but there's just four things I think we need to keep in mind as foundational truths of discipleship. Here's some things to keep in mind. First of all, life's problems often aren't simple. Some problems are simple. I wish those were the majority, not the minority. You know, your light bulb in your entryway burned out. That's a simple problem. Most problems aren't simple. That's a hard thing to, to grasp sometimes, it's a hard thing to accept. But the moment you can accept it, actually, it's going to put you ahead in your discipleship. Because that brings up the second thing, which is, most problems aren't equations to be solved. Did you know that? Most problems in life are not equations to be solved. In fact, if you want to know God's picture of your problems, the goal isn't so much how to end the suffering or how to solve the suffering, 
but to learn how to love God and love people in the midst of the suffering. That's what discipleship looks like. And often, the best, deepest work in our lives happens during complex, unsolvable problems when instead of trying to get rid of the problems, we finally learn, okay, I'm going to live for God and love the people around me in the midst of this problem. Even if it never goes away, I'm going to trust in God. Now that's a harder solution. That's a more complex solution. It's a harder solution in some of the best character traits of kindness and goodness and love are formed when we accept this. Which brings up a third thing, and that is this. The Bible doesn't tell us to look for demonic roots to all of our problems. It's always important to go back to Scripture. What does Scripture tell us to do? I'm not saying it's bad when people do this. I'm just saying the Scripture doesn't tell us to do that. We've got to just be careful. We don't overemphasize that for sure. And again, I love these little stories in the Bible where we get little glimpses of how regular life bursts through and, and, and is experienced by people like the Apostle Paul. One of my favorites is the end of 1 Timothy chapter 5. He has this one-liner to his protege, his spiritual son, Timothy. And he says this, we've looked at this one before. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine. So we could just sit there and have a whole message, right, for the Mennonites. <laughs> because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Now look at this. Whoa! Timothy had digestive problems, just like a bunch of you here today. And you've gone to the doctor a hundred times. And he said, oh, you're just, you're either just making it up or, you know, just take some Pepto-Bismol or whatever it is. And you're like, it's more serious than that. Timothy had that problem. He had that problem. Now, what's so interesting to me is what the Apostle Paul doesn't do. He doesn't say, oh, whoa, whoa. Have we done a stronghold check? This could be it. Now, again, I'm not making fun. I'm not making fun. This isn't about shame. This isn't about being wrong. Let's just look at what, what is the Bible saying. It's not that it's wrong. Some of us Christians are like, no, this is what I want to engage in. Great. If that helps you, awesome. I'm just, it's interesting to me what the Apostle Paul does. He doesn't say that might be a spirit of disease. That might be a spirit of sickness. That might be a spirit of digestive problems. He doesn't say any of those things. He just says, you know, in, in their case, it's medicine, right? Essentially, just take your medicine. And notice, he also doesn't say another thing, which again, it's not bad to say this. I continue to say it, and I continue to do it. I often, you guys, many of you come to me, or you send me emails, or, or you you know, I talk to you at church and I find out, yeah, you're going through some health stuff. And I say, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm never going to stop saying that. And I'm never going to stop doing it during the week. I often sometimes have a list beside my computer. I'll have a couple of people on there who I've talked to recently that I know are going through health things. And I'll pray for them while I'm here at church. So I love that. And I don't ever want to lose that. But you know what's funny to me is that Paul doesn't even say, hey, you know, we just got to pray a bit more. You just got to have faith. Like, I'm going to be praying for you, and you just got to get healed. You just got to believe, and it's going to happen. He didn't say any of that. He just says, take your medicine. Why? Because actually, a lot of our problems just really come down to that kind of stuff. And lastly, truths for discipleship. Fourthly, the demonic, the demonic view of problems can be a cause of unnecessary fear. On the front end, it can feel like, oh, on the front end, it's like, oh, I can, I can get a sense of control. I can fix my problem if I just cast out this demon. If I figure out this demon, cast out this demon. On the front end, that kind of thinking can give you a sense of hope and a sense of control in your life. I can fix this problem. And I totally get that. And that's, that can be a wonderful thing and a necessary thing sometimes for people in the short term. In the long term, however, it often leads to lots of unnecessary fear. I can't tell you, I'll, I'll tell you one of the most common conversations I have had as a pastor with young parents over the last 20 years. You want to know what it is? One of the most common when it comes to kids is this. My kid had a, has had a couple of nightmares the last week. Is it a demon? Now, let me tell you something. The moment, by the way, all kids have bad dreams, just so you know. Some of them have it worse than others, but all kids have bad dreams. All right? The moment you 
also now begin to think, maybe a demon is causing the bad dreams. Guess what happens to your peace and confidence as a parent in Christ? Woo! You say, but maybe it is a demon. Oh, okay. You actually don't need to. I'm not saying it's bad to think that. I'm saying, what do we actually see in Scripture? Do we see any examples? No. Does that mean it's never true? No. If you've had success, maybe the Lord worked in your life and you cast out a demon and the kid's bad dreams went away, great. I'm not saying it's bad to do any of these things. I'm just saying, what do we actually see in Scripture? What do we see in Scripture? Paul isn't scared and going around what if it's a demon? What if it's a demon? Finally, he became annoyed. I think we should have more annoyance when it comes to demons than fear. I don't see an example anywhere in Scripture where we are said that we should be worried or nervous about demons doing stuff to us or loved ones. He finally got annoyed and said, get out of here. Now you say, how could he have that kind of confidence? Oh, that's the book of Ephesians and the armor of God. He has a theology of hope, absolute hope and victory. This is why he's not scared of what ifs. We covered this last week, but let's just go through this short passage again. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. He wants us to know something. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Skip a little things because it's a big passage. One thing he wants us to be enlightened to is God's incre- incomparably great power for us, everybody here, who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. Did you know that that mighty power is for us? So why on earth are you scared? Is for us. That same mighty power is for us and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule, authority. Remember in the spiritual warfare passage in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says our struggle is against what? These authorities and powers and dominions and rulers. And guess what? They're already beaten. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is invoked. The victory is already won. Not only in the present age. We already live in the age of victory. Like, do you believe that? How many of us as Christians are not living in the present age in light of the victory that's already been won? Already living in a time of victory. Not in the time of victory in the sense that you have no problems. Oh, we have problems. But not in the age of fear that somehow the devil's about to get us and that's what he's doing through our problems. He has already been defeated. Already in the present age, but also, and also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet. Placed is past tense. Past tense has already placed. This is why Paul, when it comes to demons, isn't scared. He's not going, oh, I wonder if, they, I wonder if it's this is a demonic problem. I wonder if that's it. No, he just gets annoyed. Get out of here. And appointed him to be head over everything. Now, this next part I did not read last week. And I was waiting all week to read this next part. He has placed all things, past tense, under Jesus' feet. Past tense. All things. For who? For who? The church. Wait just a minute. God didn't place all the spiritual forces of darkness in this world under Jesus' feet just so that he could feel good about himself? No, he did it for the church, which is, in Paul's theology, Christ's body. That's, we are the body of Christ, who already has won the victory. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, if the victory has already been won, then I'll tell you, the number one way that Satan can get us. And that is to get us to forget that fact or to doubt that fact so that we start to live in fear and anxiety and shame as if the victory hasn't been won. And the next thing you know, we've completely lost our testimony in the world. Sound familiar? 
which is why we have the armor of God. Much of the armor of God is all about protecting your confidence in this hope and victory. So, he says this. Now we are back to the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. And look at what one of the key pieces of the armor is. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. What are the flaming arrows? I'll tell you what the flaming arrows are. And they fall all around us every day. It's the despair and the violence and the chaos and the outrage and the fear and the anxiety and all of the chaos that we live in in this world, broken world, every single day. Flaming arrows everywhere. And so Paul says, take up the shield of faith. He spent the first three chapters of Ephesians telling us, you don't have to give in to any of those things because the victory has already been won. It's just a matter of time before Jesus sets up his kingdom on earth and death and suffering and sin are no more. You know, it's interesting to me, every one of us who's a Christian and who has been a Christian for any amount of time will tell you when asked, 100%, does Jesus win in the end? And we will all say what? Yes. Yes. Does Jesus win in the end? Let's try it again. So why do we run around like a bunch of scared chickens in the rain? As if we think that's in doubt. Why do we run around like scared chickens? On the one hand, we know in our brains, we say we believe that Jesus wins in the end. In fact, According to Paul, he has already won. It's just a matter of time before he actually physically sets his kingdom up on earth. If we actually believe those things, it radically changes the way you live. The problem is many of us don't actually believe that in the sense of feeling it and living it every day because we have failed to put up the shield of faith. In our minds, we go, yeah, Jay, Jesus won. In the end, Jesus is going to win. Then we go outside the, the church or our home, and we read the news. Oh, it's the end of the world. Oh, and now, now every conversation with other Christians. Oh, did you see this that happened? And did you see that? Happened? It's the end. It's the end. It's a, the culture where, I'm not talking about the end times. I'm just talking about it's the end. The church is about to lose. We're all going to turn bad. Everything's twisted. It's worse than it's ever been. Even though it hasn't, that's just a failure of us knowing our history. It's better in most ways than it's ever been. I'm not saying that means it's good. There's lots of bad things in this world. But then we live as if Jesus has not won the victory, which is Paul's point in Ephesians. He says you need to put up the shield of faith. This conviction that no matter how dark and despairing and hopeless things are, this conviction that Jesus has already won and that the final ushering in of his kingdom is, as we say, assured. Now you say, but don't we have to fight for truth? No, we don't have to fight for truth. We just have to stand for it. There's a big difference. Remember I showed you a couple weeks ago, everything in the armor of God is about standing. When you actually start to sink in the waves thinking that God's actually about to lose unless you manage to do whatever it is you're doing, you have taken on to yourself the role of God. Only God wins this victory and only God ushers in his kingdom in the end. You say, yeah, but don't we have to speak up for truth? Absolutely, we have to speak up for truth. Here's how speaking for truth works when you're not scared. You just say the truth. And then you embrace your enemies. Kind of like Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You just say the truth quietly because your job isn't to win the truth. Jesus already did that. Your job isn't to usher in Christ's final kingdom. Only Jesus can do that. Your job is just to be a lighthouse. And you can just quietly say, this is the truth. I love you. Wait a minute. 
You love me? We're enemies. We disagree about stuff. Ha! This is the truth. I love you. This is the truth. Let me feed you while you persecute me. This is the truth. Let me take care of your needs like the Good Samaritan. Let me take care of your needs specifically because you disagree with me and hate me. As Christians, we are actually meant to live as if these realities are already true everywhere here on earth. And when we live with that kind of hope and love and freedom and confidence, that is our greatest act of spiritual warfare. We don't have to go looking for devils. We just have to get up every morning, take up the shield of faith, because nobody else in this world has faith right now. And they need to see examples of people who hold their heads high even when problems are complex and hard. So here's a couple of things to think about. Am I li living with any fears of demonic what-ifs? Are you tormented by any thoughts of, oh, maybe this problem is a demon? Maybe my kid is being tormented by a demon. Maybe, 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 what if, what if, what if, what if? Grab hold of Paul's confidence who ignored obvious, overt demonic issues until it finally was so annoyed he just said, get out of here. That is a confidence you can have because the victory over Satan's forces has already been won. And am I truly approaching life with the confidence that the victory is already won? You don't have to shout above the waves. You can just speak quietly because God's already won the victory and love your enemies. Bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Father in heaven, what a blessing it is to remind ourselves of the truth that good has already conquered evil. And it is an inevitable, foregone conclusion that your kingdom will be set up here on earth. And nothing that rages around us today is going to be able to change that. Help us to stand out from our non-Christian neighbors in the levels of hope and joy and love for our enemies that we live with. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.